Genies, it's Fisher with exciting news. The Weekly Genie, the official newsletter of Extreme Genes, is here. It's your Monday morning briefing on what's happening in the world of genealogy and family history and on Extreme Genes. Get all the details of jaw-dropping stories of discovery and keep up with the latest techniques in family history research. Get to know more about your favorite Extreme Genes personalities. And it's free. Sign up for The Weekly Genie now at ExtremeGenes.com or the Extreme Jean's Facebook page. And when you do, you'll receive David Allen Lambert's top 10 tips for beginning genealogists from the chief genealogist of the New England Historic Genealogical Society. Sign up today for the Weekly Genie. Yeah, I don't think Mother knew about this. Uncle Marvin was strangled by his own beard. Never saw it coming. Hey, how are you? Welcome to America's Family History Show, Extreme Genes and ExtremeGenes.com. My name is Fisher. I am your radio root sleuth on the program where we shake your family tree and watch the nuts fall out. This segment of our show is brought to you by FamilySearch.org. And uh, I'm very excited today. we got a, a couple of fascinating guests. Ellie Catmull, she is the Senior Manager of Research at LegacyTree.com in Salt Lake City, Utah. And she's going to come on and talk about the question I think I get from more people than almost anything else. What about Eastern Europe? It has always been a difficult thing uh, to research. There's not a lot online about it yet, although it's getting better. She's going to fill you in on what to do if you want to actually hire professionals over there to research or you want to go over on your own. How do you know where the repositories are? Where are the records? How to prepare for a trip like that? She's going to have that for you coming up a little bit later on. After that, we're going to talk to my fifth cousin, somebody I actually met online doing research named Susan Leach Snyder. And Susan is doing exactly what I've recently talked about in the Weekly Genie newsletter, and that is becoming the go-to person for your family and having a connection to the family that she has posted a lot about. I found her. We were able to share information, and she's gathered a lot of stuff that has come as a result of her having this website devoted to this one family. She'll tell you about the experience, some of the things that have come to her that she hasn't even had to look for. It's great stuff coming up later on. But right now, let's check into Springfield, Illinois. My good friend David Allen Lambert is out there for the Federation of Genealogical Societies Convention. And uh, David, how's it going so far? Well, it started off with a shocking good time for me before I landed in Chicago. Really? Uh, yeah. You ever been on a plane that was struck by lightning? <laughs> no, I haven't had that experience. I, yeah. That, <laughs> wow. That, yeah. That's one for the history books for me. The pilot came on and said, yes, that was lightning that just struck our wing. <laughs> Boy. I saw an orange flash and the plane shook a little bit, but we landed safely. Now, Lincoln is buried in Springfield, is he not? He is, in fact, our first stop even before going to the hotel was to go to the tomb out at Oak Grove Cemetery and pay the respects to our late martyred president. And today I actually went to his home, which is historically accurate and been restored. It is beautiful and uh, invite anybody to go out there. It's uh, it's amazing. There's so much history of Lincoln. I went by his law office today, which they're actually restoring. That's awesome. All right. What do you have for us today for our family histoire news? Well, I'll tell you, the first thing that I want to toss out is obviously I'm here for the Federation of Genealogical Societies. They're having their conference here in Springfield and lots of exciting genealogical news and interviews I'll bring forward for next week. So so stay tuned for that. But I created something new on Twitter. I'm a DL genealogist. And of course, we have extreme genes on Twitter as well as our Facebook page. But I want you to try something new, folks. Find an old family photo or a historic site, put hashtag history selfie, and then recreate that photo, even if it was done 10 years ago or 110 years ago. You'll see an example I'm going to send you later, Fisher. I hope you'll get a kick out of it. Yeah. My next story is about Stuart Marshall of South Carolina, a 97-year-old World War II veteran who got nine awards recently. It's amazing to think he had to wait that many years. Yeah, I, I wonder why the delay, but he got all kinds of medals. The bronze star is among them. 
Yeah, U.S. Army Medal. And he was in six different campaigns as a staff sergeant with 135th Division in the U.S. Army. And hats off to Stuart Marshall and uh, all our other veterans of uh, World War II that are still with us. I mean, I'll tell you, 97 years young, and uh, to get that award, um, it's better late than never. Absolutely. Well, I'll tell you, strolling around Springfield, Illinois today, I came across something I didn't even know was out here. The Korean War National Museum, not just for Illinois, but for the whole nation, is here in Springfield, Illinois, and across from the old state capitol. It's open for free, and it's a great little museum with artifacts and uniforms and stories of the veterans from the Korean conflict. I highly suggest people take a visit. Our next story is a little older. This has to be the most interesting <laughs> story I think you and I have talked about. Uh, yeah. Maba Gotho, mm -hmm. born December 31st, 1870, still alive today yeah. at 145. That's what they're saying. And the government I'm... is substantiating this, saying, yes, he's 145. In fact, they show a picture of his government ID card, and it gives his birth date, 31 December, 1870. It's amazing. Do you he believe uh, it? lived his 10 siblings, four wives, 11 children, and his grandchildren are senior citizens. I mean, it's amazing. Uh, well, the, the question is do you believe it? Do you really think he's 145? I mean, there uh, could be one person in the world who's the outlier, I suppose. I suppose so. I mean, and I don't think Indonesia uses a slightly different longer calendar. There are years <laughs> on every six months, and he isn't right. just an old 72 and a half year old. It opens up the world of doubt, but the world of. Wow. I mean, it really sure. is an amazing possibility that this man could be the oldest person in recorded history. Jean Calumet of France holds a record. She was born in the mid-1870s. And my real question is, why did it take so long for this to come out? Uh, that's a good question. First of all, Gene passed a few years ago, like at 122 or something, right? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. And, and this guy, though, I mean, they're saying they're going to have to get some independent confirmation on his age before Guinness will certify that he is the oldest person in recorded times. Well, next week they'll probably find his parents and they can verify that he was born. <laughs> and he's saying the only thing he wants left out of life is for it to end. He's tired. He bought his gravestone in 1992. I know. I mean, it's so, I mean, it's uh, it's unbelievable. I mean, so I, I guess this one would be extreme genes, believe it or not. Exactly. All right. What do you have for our free guest user database for NEHGS this week? Well, we have three databases for Maine, including Gray, Westport, and Richmond, Maine. These are 18th and 19th century databases, a part of the free guest user database at AmericanAncestors.org. Well, lots of things going on here at the Federation of Genealogical Society. Society's conference. I'll bring you some more news next week, and hopefully I won't be struck by lightning, and I can report back <laughs> next week. He's the chief genealogist of the New England Historic Genealogical Society and AmericanAncestors.org, David Allen Lambert. And we're going to talk to Ellie Catmull next. She's the senior manager of research at LegacyTree.com in Salt Lake City, Utah, talking about those difficult records from Eastern Europe and other tough countries that are finally opening up in three minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. When someone asks what is forever.com, I tell them it's a new kind of digital storage, like for your photos and documents and all the family memories. And they always shoot back with, well, that's not a very new thing. There's Facebook Shutterfly Flickr. Then I say, oh, but on forever, you own all your content. There's no third party ads and it's guaranteed for your lifetime, plus 100 years. Do the others do that? Okay, so like I said, forever.com, a new kind of digital storage. You are the chief memory officer of your family. You get that frantic phone call about the reunion in two days and they need the slideshow. And you're ready because you use forever.com. Photos, news clippings, heck, you automatically upload the photos on your cell phone every day. You have everything digitally stored and organized where you can share it privately with your friends and family. No ads and it's permanent, guaranteed for generations. Yes, you are the chief memory officer and you have forever.com. 
Legacy Tree Genealogists is a proud sponsor of Extreme Genes. Based in Salt Lake City, Utah, near the world's largest family history library, we've been working with genealogists all over the globe since 2004 to track down records, find your ancestors, and the stories that bring your legacy to life. We also analyze DNA test results, help you join lineage societies, and find missing cousins or heirs to property. Legacy Tree is the recommended research partner of MyHeritage.com and is the world's highest client-rated genealogy firm. Call us toll-free at 1-800-818-1476. Call now or register online to get a free estimate. Learn from our free genealogy tips on our blog at LegacyTree.com slash blog. Even experienced researchers can benefit from our proven and experienced staff of specialists who can bring new approaches to old problems. Legacy Tree Genealogists. We do the research. You enjoy the discoveries. LegacyTree.com. Did you know that Family Search Family Tree is available through a powerful new mobile app experience? That's right. Now you can view, edit, and even add information to ancestors in your family tree whenever and wherever you are. You no longer need to wait to get home or make a date with your computer to view or update your family tree. You can add details to your tree when visiting with family or when capturing details from a trip to the cemetery. You can share new family history discoveries from classroom settings. You can even make the most of your time when waiting for doctor appointments or car repairs. Get started today by downloading the free Family Search Family Tree app to your Apple or Android device. Visit familysearch.org slash tree app to get the Family Tree app for free. Exploring and expanding your family tree has never been more convenient. Visit familysearch.org slash tree app to download the Family Search Family Tree mobile app today. And welcome back to America's Family History Show, Extreme Genes and ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here, your radio root sleuth. And uh, I'm talking to Ellie Catmull today. She is the Senior Manager of Research for LegacyTree.com. Hi, Ellie. Welcome to the show. Thank you. You know, I'm always hearing from people who are asking, what about Eastern Europe? Because that's an area that really hasn't been digitized much. And of course, most people love to do everything online, but it's really difficult for a lot of countries at this point to expect to find much there. You and your company, Legacy Tree, have researchers in many countries around the world. Tell us what you've learned about what's available if people would like to travel to, say, Kazakhstan or Poland or Russia or Lithuania. How can they find records there relating to their people? Well, the first key, of course, is to find out exactly where their ancestors were from. The records are usually organized by town or maybe by church, depending on what religion they participated in, the ancestors were in. So before going, a researcher will need to know what town their ancestors came from and what religion they were part of. That is absolutely the key piece of information they need to know before they go. So in essence, it's just do your homework here first, which is the case pretty much for any trip you're going to take, even in Western Europe. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, and then you figure out what the name of the town was, and then you have to figure out where that town was, because a a town with one name, you know, may be in several localities. So you figure out the name of the town, where it was, and then where are those records held now? Um, And there are a lot of resources online, a lot of resources online and through the Family History Library, for example, or uh, jewishgen.org, different things like that to, you know, identify where those records might be held. Now, you do have the challenge, of course, of borders that have moved and wars and things like that. So let's talk about some of the countries that might have something of a record deficit as a result of the war. How about Poland? That's a very common place for a lot of American ancestors uh, to have come from. What's the status of Polish records these days? Polish records are actually pretty well organized and very well kept. So Poland is usually not an issue. Once you know where the town was, the records will be either kept at the state archive or a local archive or possibly at the church level, just depending on which record and what you're looking for. Did they lose a lot during the war? There were records lost, but it's not what you might think. And often there might be supplemental records. For example, we recently were working on a 
Jewish case where the particular records for the town had been destroyed during the time that the ancestors that we knew about lived in that town. Those particular records had been destroyed. However, there were still records from earlier for that town. And so we could search those records for the same names just to kind of find out what had happened in the town and who people were. So there were also other records available that we found relating to the military that could be searched for the people who had joined the military in that town and were very detailed records. So we could wow. find alternates to birth, death, and marriage records. Now, that's kind of like Holland. I mean, Holland required military service in the 19th century especially, and they had a lot of family history information in those things. Right. We've also found success using census records. Censuses, of course, weren't like they are in the United States every 10 years and super detailed. But depending on the time and the place and the town, there might have been a census that would be useful. So there are alternates to records that may have been destroyed. Okay, more on Eastern Europe countries. How about Czechoslovakia? Czechoslovakia is good. I've seen a lot of success in Czechoslovakia. Romania is very difficult. Yeah, I hear it's getting, I I hear though getting better. They are, and you know, they are everywhere. Um, Probably the best country to research in Eastern Europe is Estonia. Their records are fantastic. Most of them are online, they're indexed, they're well kept. Very good country to work with. Belarus is probably one of the most difficult. Their records are very, very scattered and not so well organized. You know, you may plan a trip to an archive based on what that archive says they have in their collection. You know, you've identified the town. Right. You're going to go search. You've identified that the records for this town are at this specific archive. The archive says they have the records. You go to the archive, and lo and behold, they aren't there. Oh. That, that <laughs> happens in Belarus. <laughs> oh, boy. Yes. And it's a result of many things. Like you said, the changing of the boundaries and things like that. It just happens. So that's happened in Belarus. I've seen that happen in Romania. We had a case once in Romania where, you know, we knew that the town records were in the archive in Jazi. And the researcher went to search those records. And it turned out that the archive could not find the records. They knew that they were at the archive, but they physically could not find the books within their holdings. And so the researcher had to go home. The archive spent about six weeks searching their holdings, physically searching for these books within their archive. Then they found them. Then they had to index, you know, they had to catalog them (laughs) and go through all of them. So... The good news is we were eventually able to research these records, but it took quite a while. It took a second trip to be able to do so. So if somebody was going to go over, say, to Eastern Europe and research their ancestors, what about the language situation? For instance, specifically in Eastern Europe, are there a lot of people there who speak English that are helpful? Is that the common second language? And uh, if not, what is the best way to deal with the language situation? From what I understand, there are many people who speak English. I've heard that Poland is one of the best places to visit as an English speaker or as an American citizen. So I would recommend setting up some translation help assistance before mm-hmm. you go. There are lots of researchers that you can find online who will work as kind of a, they'll act as kind of a genealogy guide and they will take you to the different archives and help you with the translations and help you with communication and scheduling and, you know, cultural differences and things like that. So that's definitely something to look into. Boy, and that's like the trip of a lifetime. Right? Listening to what you're saying right now, I'm talking to Ellie Catmull, by the way. She's the Senior Manager of Research at LegacyTree.com. I mean, I was just thinking, 10 years ago, we could not have had this kind of conversation I mean, for years and years and years, the idea, oh, Eastern Europe, forget about it. (laughs) There's just no hope, but it's so different. It's important to remember that there are still differences and there are still obstacles that can occur in researching in archives in Eastern Europe. I had a researcher once who left 
to go to an archive, and the road was blocked by tanks, and he oh. had to turn around and go home. It just <laughs> happens. That'll make for a different kind of research trip, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, archives will close. Randomly, they will just close. They might be moving to a new archive. They might be just taking a break. They might be, you know, adjusting their holdings. It's not quite as regulated as we expect here. Other obstacles that happen, the holdings will often be in restoration. So you might, you know, be expecting to research a specific set of books or records, and then when you go to the archive, lo and behold, those books are not available Mm. because they have been sent for restoration. That's actually pretty common. And it's not something you can always know ahead of time. You can call ahead. It's absolutely recommended that you call ahead, schedule ahead, plan ahead. Yeah, email. Email, yes. Any way that you can to set yourself up for success. But these things happen. And so planning you know, maybe to stay for several days just in case you can't access it the first day or, you know, planning a follow-up trip or coordinating with someone who lives there who can do follow-up if needed. Um, You know, it's, it's really important to remember that these records, they're very precious to the people who live there. The archivists take very good, they do the best they can to take very good care of them. Right. But there are cultural differences between us that may we may not fully understand, but we have to work with because these are their records, this is their archive, this is their country, and we simply need to work around whatever it is. Sure. And so I think a lot of people don't realize how much goes into finding every little <laughs> record that comes out of these countries. Every record is precious, so precious. So you may spend 20, 40, 60 hours, you know, searching and find one or two records and it's still worthwhile. Yeah, that's right. And, and you know, you think about this too, Ellie, is if you're going to go over there and do it yourself, it's going to be very expensive and you really kind of have to almost weigh whether it would be a better thing to use people like yourselves to, you know, professionals there because things can be stretched out over a much longer period of time than you have to research there. But Absolutely. if you've got some background in it and you want to have that cultural experience of going to the place your ancestors were from, which is a phenomenal thing to do. I've done it many, many times. That might be the way you want to go as well. It's really kind of a personal choice, isn't it? Absolutely. And, you know, you may want to do a mix of both. You know, you may sure. have a researcher that you work with over there, and then you're able to plan a trip and do some research as well yourself. So there's definitely advantages to both. She's Ellie Catmull. She's the Senior Manager of Research at LegacyTree.com in Salt Lake City, Utah. Ellie, thanks for coming on the show and really interesting stuff and exciting stuff, too, to hear. Sure. Thank you. And this segment of Extreme Genes has been brought to you by 23andMe.com DNA. And coming up next, we'll talk to a woman who has planted her family flag where you can find it and bring things to her. And you can do the same thing. We'll tell you about it coming up in five minutes. Scientific studies have proven that youth who know even a little bit about their family history perform better academically and have a greater sense of personal confidence and stability. Genealogy is its own incredible superpower that arms our children with super strength. But how do you get your child or grandchild interested in studying their family history? That kind of stuff is just for grandmas, right? Not anymore. Zap the grandma gap.com leaps the generation gap in a single bound. Author Janet Havorka provides you with useful and timely advice on helping the young people in your life become engaged in their own family history. Janet has an entire collection of books to inspire the young and the young at heart in fun, interactive ways. She also offers creative tips and advice on her blog and in her free weekly newsletter. Stop by ZapTheGrandmaGap.com today to sign up for Janet's free email newsletter with 52 weeks of easy tips, free downloads, and order your set of resource books and workbooks.
Looking for an easy way to show off your family history and share it with your family? Family Chart Masters offers beautiful custom pedigree art pieces and inexpensive family reunion draft charts in any design or size that fits your needs. With a free consultation at FamilyChartMasters.com, you can get started creating a new family masterpiece. Family Chart Masters has over 11 years of experience in creating and printing family charts. They can print any style of genealogy chart from any genealogy file and can create exactly what you're looking for. You'll work with a specialized and talented consultant whose goal is to make you happy. Decorative charts make fantastic gifts for all occasions. And with Family Chart Master's option of ordering duplicate charts at half price along with your original purchase at full price, you can afford to give a family heirloom to each member of your family. Contact Family Chart Masters today at FamilyChartMasters.com for your free consultation. Family Chart Masters will give the greatest care to your family history. And we're back. It's Extreme Genes, America's family history show, and ExtremeGenes.com. Fisher here, your radio root sleuth. And uh, in the past couple of weeks, I made mention in the Weekly Genie, our free newsletter that you can subscribe to at ExtremeGenes.com and on our Facebook page, about this concept of becoming the go-to person for your family. And maybe you could do that for several lines. You know, we all have different grandparent lines and great-grandparent lines. And I've had the benefit of that uh, for many years now myself on both my wife's side and my side. So that basically when people are looking to find out new information about certain lines, they find me. And recently, well, not all that recently, I guess it's been a few years now, I found someone else doing the same thing for one of my lines that goes back to a fourth great-grandparent set and found my fifth cousin had a flag up there saying, this is where the Leach family is. And she's on the line with me right now, Susan Leach Snyder in Columbus, Ohio. How are you, Susan? How are you, just, cousin? Just great, Scott. <laughs> and we've been in touch for a little bit uh, the last few years and exchanging information. And I really like this idea of planting a flag out there for people to find you instead of you having to go out and doing all the work. And you started this, Susan, just as a website, a simple project overall, I would say, and you just update it periodically when other people bring things to you. What's the experience been like? It's been unbelievable. I started out just putting my own family on, and then I started getting cousins and brothers and uncles and all these other people who kept contacting me and adding information, and I just kept putting it on. So it's snowballed. And as we've talked about this, of course, you and I have had some exchanges and had some amazing finds together as a result of things you've given me and then that I've been able to develop and share back with you. You've had several other things I hadn't even heard about. Let's talk about some of these things. One of the first ones took place back in, what, 2007? Yes. I got this strange email from a lady in Canada. And she had purchased a whole box full of books and was looking through and found that one of the books was inscribed with the name Watson Leach, and it was a small note to his son, Charles. So she had Googled those names and came up with my website. Well, Watson <laughs> is my great-grandfather, and Charles is my grandfather. you got to be kidding me. And so yeah. she provided you the book. She sell it to you, give it to you, she, what'd she, she do? She sold it to me, but it wasn't that expensive. Sure. But I thought it was so odd. She's in Canada. I'm in Ohio. The book originated in Ohio, and it came back to Ohio. That's nuts, isn't it? And did you have anything ever written by your great-grandfather before? Nothing. And so what a nice personal item. What have you done with it? Well, I have the book and a huge box of things that are my grandfather's, and I'm trying to put everything as I scan it onto the website. Just to add it and keep it growing. Yes. All right, in 2010, you got another email, this one from North Carolina. Yep, another strange connection from a guy named Keith Egan, Edens. And Keith is a mason, and he was shopping in a flea market and found a Masonic coin, so he bought it. That was in 1998. Put it in a drawer, came across it a few years later, saw that there was a name on it that was very legible, and so he Googled the name H.C. Coalrider. He emailed me that he thought I was related to this person, and I was. That's Henry Clay Coalrider, my great-grandfather. And so he wanted to give me the coin, and I offered to buy it, and he said, no, 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 I want to give this to you. Can you meet me somewhere? And I said, well, where do you live? And he said, Greensboro, North Carolina. 
And I said, well, I'm going to be traveling from Florida back to Ohio next year. How about that? And he said, let's meet at the Cracker Barrel. So he gave me the coin. How cool is that with your great-grandfather's name on it? And I found out more about his being a mason because of that coin, too. Sure. And did you wind up researching? We just actually did a a whole segment on uh, Masonic Lodges and how to find some of the records. Were you successful in finding some of his uh, Masonic records? I was, and I posted all those online. So all that information plus the coin can be seen on my website also. That's incredible. And then in 2010, you received something that actually impacted me. Talk about that. Well, I got an email from a Jacqueline Gasparro. And she was Googling the Leach family, found my site, and she was asking me the source of some of the information I had. And so I gave her the sources, and she said, oh, by the way, I have a couple of uh, Bibles, an 1834 and an 1854 Bible that belong in my family, and I've scanned the pages. Would you be interested? (laughs) They said, are you kidding? And so she sent them. And the 1834 Bible had my great-great-great-grandfather Amos and his siblings in it. Right. And the 1854 Bible had one of Amos's brothers and the whole family in it. And I thought it was going to stop with that, but it didn't. Uh, well, no. Well, let's just talk about these Bibles for a minute, because uh, Jacqueline actually got these out of the trash bin, and she had been helping to clean up uh, some relative's home. The person had passed away, family was there, and they were throwing everything out, and she found the Bibles in the trash See, I didn't know that part of the story. Yes, and so uh, what a rescue for her and, of course, for all of us because not only were your ancestors' names in there, but my ancestors' names were in there. I guess my great-great-grandfather Amos was the brother of your great, well, I don't know how many greats. Yeah, same thing. Third third, third great, yes, grandmother. And that's where we tie in is through uh, the parents of those two, and that makes us, uh, what what did we figure, fifth fifth cousins, fifth cousins, yes. And so as a result of those Bible records being rescued, then I was able to connect into that line and go on from there. And, of course, I was able then to link back on one of my sides to the Mayflower Society. And that has all been as a result of your website attracting people. It's kind of like a flag in the sand when people start looking, hey, I've got something connected to this. They contact you. Well, you know, it's amazing how how things have changed since my father began studying genealogy and relying on letters and calls, phone calls. And we've come this yeah, far. <laughs> exactly. And there is effort. I mean, obviously, you've had to maintain this site. You've had to maintain correspondence. You've had to learn a few technical things in order to manage it, but it has certainly paid a lot of dividends. And just a few weeks ago, you shared with me this letter that Sean Sweeney had sent to you. And tell him about that. Well, again, I get this strange email from somebody I don't know. Tells me his name is Sean Sweeney, and he is sorting through his stepfather's materials, and he had come across a letter. And the letter was written by Electa Leach in 1815. It was hard to figure it out at first, but we figured out that she was a teacher. Right. She was going to teach her first group of kids, and the kids were bigger than she was in some (laughs) cases, and she was saying in her letter she was glad that they'd been well-behaved so far. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) that's true. anyway, yeah, so Sean had Googled and connected the the leech, but I couldn't even figure out how he did it until I got back on my website, and I saw that Electa was the daughter of one of my relatives, brothers. Right. And his name is Ephraim Leach, and Ephraim Leach is my great, 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 five great grandfather. And mine. And yours. And so this was a a very distant cousin to us now, but it was his niece. Yeah. And this letter also mentioned uh, Ephraim in there, too, that he was not in good health. and, And it is a fact that within a year he was gone. Yeah. And so he gave us a timeline, too. Yeah. And I love it. And it mentioned in there was in January of 1815, It talked about wanting to visit a nearby village to see family, but they were waiting for good sleighing weather. (laughs) They were going to take a sled to get to where they needed to be. I mean, talk about different times. Yes. Well, Susan, thanks uh, so much for for sharing the experience here. And, of course, being a great partner with me, I've enjoyed it. And I thought everybody would enjoy hearing what you've done in basically letting everybody know that, hey, you're the person, the go-to person for the Leach family. 
And anybody can really set this up the same way you have for whatever their family lines may be that they're interested in. I've had many people come to me about different branches on both my wife's side and uh, and my side as well. So it was a thrill to find you, and thanks for coming on Extreme Genes. Thanks for asking me, Scott. And this segment of our show has been brought to you by RootsMagic.com. And coming up next, you got a deadline closing in on you, and you might not even know about it. Yeah, Tom Perry's here to talk preservation. He'll explain the whole thing in three minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. You know, everybody needs a place of their own to plant their family tree, preferably one that no one else can mess with and only you can control. That perfect place is Roots Magic. Roots Magic has been a family history standard for years, and now Roots Magic 7 is on the market. It's an award-winning genealogical software program which makes researching, organizing, and sharing your family history easy. You can start from scratch or import data from other software or even family search. Roots Magic also automatically finds records relating to your ancestors from MyHeritage, FamilySearch, and soon Ancestry and Find My Past. You can use it to create beautiful charts, reports, and books. And have you ever thought about making your own family history website? Roots Magic can make that happen too. And of course, there are free videos, guides, and technical support to help you along. Isn't it about time you planted your family tree? Whether you're a beginning genie or experienced professional, Roots Magic is the perfect tool for you. Well, Genies, my personal family history researcher who sends me new information day and night has sent me some incredible new records and newspaper stories lately. Hi, it's Fisher, and the name of that researcher, by the way, is MyHeritage.com. It's the hardest working service in genealogy, looking for records of your family 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Yes, even while you're sleeping. How does it work? MyHeritage uses hundreds of algorithms to match your ancestors to over 5 billion records from around the world. and with 97% accuracy. That means no more wasting time figuring out whether or not a match really is a match. I hear from listeners all the time who are shocked with how much information is accurately found and then passed along. And now MyHeritage will translate your ancestors' names into English or any other language you like from foreign records. In fact, it works with over 40 languages. No one else does this. Whether you're a beginner or seasoned researcher, you need MyHeritage.com. Extreme Genes is sponsored in part by 23andMe.com, a personalized genetic service that helps you understand what your 23 pairs of chromosomes, your DNA, say about you. 23andMe.com gives you a snapshot view of your DNA with more than 60 detailed reports on your health, traits, and ancestry, plus tools to explore and compare your DNA with family and friends. 23andMe.com is the first and only genetic service available directly to you that includes reports that meet FDA standards. Here's how it works. Order your DNA kit from 23andMe.com. Provide your saliva sample from home and mail it back to a CLIA certified lab. Then you'll be notified when your reports are ready online. You'll also receive ongoing reports as new genetic discoveries are made and as 23andMe.com is able to clear new reports through the FDA. See why more than 1 million people are experiencing their genetics with 23andMe.com. Order your DNA kit today at 23andMe.com. All right, you're going to wonder why it is we're talking holidays already. Hi, it's Fisher. It's Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show, and ExtremeGenes.com. Tom Perry is here from TMCPlace.com, our preservation authority. And uh, Tom, now we're getting to the end of summer. This is it? This is the time we're supposed to be preparing for the holidays? Oh, it is. Absolutely. When you're doing things like this, there's so many steps you need to go through to get everything right. Well, preparing to get the best gifts you can, which includes digitized photographs, digitized maybe even edited videos with some voiceover or something. I mean, that's a lengthy project that takes some time and effort. And to get organized for that is a little bit different than getting organized for something else. Right. It's so true. You really need to plan out what you're doing. It's just like the old saying, you know, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. Right. Whether you have videotapes, audio tapes, slides, photos, anything, you need to get organized. Because the better organized you are, the better the job's going to get done the way you want it, and the less it's going to cost you. Like we have people that bring in literally 
box that they found in, you know, Aunt Martha's garage of photos that there's little teeny ones the size of postage stamps, there's eight by tens, five by sevens, all these different sizes, and they're mixed in, and somebody has to sort them. So if they bring us in this box and just says, hey, you know, do it, send me the bill, whatever, you know, we can do that. However, if they would take the time to sort it, they're going to get them the way they want. Like, may say, oh, let's put Martha's family here, let's put Janelle's family here, let's put Lila's family over here. And it makes it so much easier than having to go down once we've got everything scanned and take every photo and drop them into different envelopes and organize them that way. It's so much smarter to take your original box that's disorganized, possibly dirty even if it hasn't been, you know, still it didn't have a lid on it. Then you go into sorted boxes. And the best things that I found that work for these is you buy these little sterilite boxes at just about any place. They're like a buck a piece. They're like a shoe box, but they're plastic with a lid on them. Huh. And get these and set them out. Okay, I want these to be by family, or I want these to be by year, or I want them to be by decade, or however, and then go and sort everything. Then once you have everything sorted, then you want what we call is a clean box. And this is really, really important because your scans are only going to be as good as your original is. If you want to take them into us or anybody across the country and say, hey, I want you to clean these for me too, we're all happy to do it. However, we have to pay our techs to do that, so it's going to cost you more. Go to an art store and invest into like a camel hair brush or squirrel tail brush, something like that, that will get rid of the dirt without scratching your photos and get yourself some white gloves. This is one of the times the white gloves are really good. Right, right. And then just lightly dust them off. If you use the air that we've talked about in the cans before, you want to be really, really careful. Right. If you shake those cans and then you press on them, you're going to freeze whatever you're doing. And if you freeze a a slide or something like that, they can crack. Sure, easily. Or even flake off parts of a photograph. Exactly. In fact, what I did is at our store where we kind of are in a tight spot in one of the places where one of our film rooms, we went down to Sears and bought a little teeny compressor. It's about the size of two shoe boxes. Plug it in. It's got a little air thing. And no matter what you do, that's never going to get cold and damage your things. And just use that air set on the lowest pressure setting and blow off your slides, photos, whatever you have. Even VHS tapes, you have to do that. And another thing that's really important that I want to mention with VHS tapes, which we've never talked about before, some people, for some reason, put labels on the front side that goes into the VCR. They'll usually have an arrow on the tape. Really? Oh, yeah. They put them on the wrong side. It's going to save you a lot of money if you remove those before you bring them into us. If you don't want to deal with us, we're happy to do it. Anybody's happy to do it for you. It's just going to cost. Because what happens if you have that sticky stuff on, when the door opens... It's going to get jammed in their machine, cause all kinds of problems. So that's why we have to remove them. And if you take some gunk remover that you can get at Home Depot and peel it off the best you can and use that stuff with a Q-tip and clean it off, it's going to be better. You won't have the problems. Some places are going to call you and say, hey, we can't do this. Sorry. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, I would have never thought that somebody would bring it in like that. Lots of them. Now that you have your clean box, we'll tell you what to do with it. And that'll be in our next segment in three minutes. And this segment has been brought to you by Forever.com on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Looking for an easy way to show off your family history and share it with your family? Family Chartmasters offers beautiful custom pedigree art pieces and inexpensive family reunion draft charts in any design or size that fits your needs. With a free consultation at FamilyChartmasters.com, you can get started creating a new family masterpiece. Family Chartmasters has over 11 years of experience in creating and printing family charts. They can print any style of genealogy chart from any genealogy file and can create exactly what you're looking for. You'll work with a specialized and talented consultant whose goal is to make you happy. Decorative charts make fantastic gifts for all occasions. And with Family Chart Master's option of ordering duplicate charts at half price along with your original purchase at full price, you can afford to give a family heirloom to each member of your family. Contact Family Chart Masters today at FamilyChartMasters.com for your free consultation. Family Chart Masters will give the greatest care to your family history. When was the last time you heard your grandmother's voice or saw your family enjoying life back in the 1950s or 60s? If the reason is you haven't known what to do with your old recordings, videos, and films, here's your answer. The Multimedia Center in Salt Lake City. We brought in a video project to the Multimedia Center, and overnight, they duplicated it to DVD so we could meet our deadline. The Multimedia Center, 2870 East, 3300 South, Salt Lake City. Open Monday through Friday, 10 to 6. Call 801-483-1717 or go to transfer duplication. 
Extremegenes.com. Extreme Genes is sponsored in part by 23andMe.com, a personalized genetic service that helps you understand what your 23 pairs of chromosomes, your DNA, say about you. 23andMe.com gives you a snapshot view of your DNA with more than 60 detailed reports on your health, traits, and ancestry, plus tools to explore and compare your DNA with family and friends. 23andMe.com is the first and only genetic service available directly to you that includes reports that meet FDA standards. Here's how it works. Order your DNA kit from 23andMe.com, provide your saliva sample from home, and mail it back to a CLIA certified lab. Then you'll be notified when your reports are ready online. You'll also receive ongoing reports as new genetic discoveries are made and as 23andMe.com is able to clear new reports through the FDA. See why more than 1 million people are experiencing their genetics with 23andMe.com. Order your DNA kit today at 23andMe.com. And we are back for our final segment of Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show and ExtremeGenes.com. Preservation time with Tom Perry from TMCPlace.com. And in our last segment, we were talking about getting organized because this is the time of year you need to get your preservation holiday projects ready to go. And we were talking about sorting everything by year or decade or family and then putting them in what they call a clean box, or you do, Tom. And where do we go from there with this now? Okay, this is a really important step. Even if it's things that you think, hey, these aren't my favorite slides, I don't want to really scan them right now, I just want to hang on to them. You still want to get them in the clean box because you've gotten rid of the dirt and all these kind of things, so they're going to store better. So then you take the things out of the clean box that you do want to scan and put them in a box to be scanned. And the thing is, you might say, well, you know, I can only afford so much right now. I want to do my film and my slides because that's what degenerates the fastest. Right. So let's do those. Then we'll do our video cassettes, and then we'll do our audio cassettes because that's the order that they, you know, go bye-bye, so to speak. And so then what you would do is bring it into us or send it to whoever your local place is, and say, okay, here's exactly what I want. I've got all my photos in size. I've got 450 of them. I know I've got these little postage stamp ones. The more information you can give to us or any of the other people out there, the better job we're going to be able to do. So we can say, okay, we can give you a better quote because we know you have 100 postage stamp size photos. Those are going to have to all be done by hand. And then we can also say, okay, so you want them in separate folders with Aunt Martha, with Aunt Lila, with all these different names on them. And then we can put them in separate folders so you can give the people that want all the folders your entire archive. You can people that just want Aunt Martha's stuff, then you give them Aunt Martha's things. It makes it so much easier to organize. And now that clouds are so easily accessible and most of them are free, it makes it so easy for you to upload what you want and then give them the password to be able to get in. And you can limit a password for like 30 days. So say, hey, you've got this password. It's only going to work for 30 days. Go and download the stuff so you don't fill up your box. That's right. I found uh, an interview I did with some neighbor people back in 1989. And uh, they passed shortly after that. And then we had it digitized. And I didn't know I had a digitized version of it. I went back to the family, the survivors, and said, hey, I've still got this interview from, wow, it was like 27 years ago said, would you like it? And did exactly that. Put it up on the cloud, gave them access to it. The kids have it. The grandkids have it now. Some of them never even knew these people. So, you know, it's of great value to them because it was a one-hour interview about their lives. Oh, it makes it so much nicer now. There's two ways you can have things on the cloud. You can have it just as a storage where you can't actually view it on the cloud. You have to download it to your computer, and then you can view it. And there's also things that are what they call real-time or ready access. So if somebody has a film that they want to be out in Dotham, Alabama, maybe out in the middle of nowhere and want to, you know, show at the family reunion this video, they can actually show it on their computers live in real time. However, that takes up a lot of room on the sure. cloud. Yes. And most cloud services that are free, you get so much after that you have to buy. So make sure when you choose clouds, whether it's Google Cloud, iCloud, Dropbox, whoever you want to use, make sure you understand what you're going to be using it for. If you want everything to be live real time, then make sure you sign up for more memory. If you just wanted a storage device where other family members can download it and then watch it, it's going to cost you a whole lot less and you're going to be able to get a whole lot more stuff up on your cloud as well. Boy, there's so many details involved in this, but the most important one right now is this is the critical time to get your holiday project started and get it done by what, late October? Oh, absolutely. You need to do it now. We have people come in at the end of October, and we can usually get all their stuff done like most people out there. But once you start getting in November, 
we don't know depending on what came in on October. So you could come in in November and everybody's full. All right, Tom. Great advice. Thanks. And we'll see you again next week. See you then. And this segment of Extreme Genes has been brought to you by LegacyTree.com and our friends at MyHeritage.com. Thanks so much for joining us. Don't forget to sign up for our brand new newsletter, The Weekly Genie. It comes out on Mondays. You can sign up at ExtremeGenes.com or on our Facebook page and find out all kinds of great audio, links, commentary, guest commentary. It's a lot of fun. And, of course, it's free. Talk to you again next week. Thanks for joining us. And remember, as far as everyone knows, we're a nice, normal family. Family.